We've got a lot to get through today, so much um, rich material in the book of Ephesians. I want to begin by asking you a question. I don't want you to answer out loud. I just want you to ponder it for a second and think of what you would give as an answer to the following question here. What makes you feel loved? What is it that makes you feel loved, makes you feel cherished, makes you feel special, valued, right? In week two here of our Ephesians study, if you've ever wondered, does God really love me? If you've ever questioned, um, does God really cherish you? Does he really value you? Does he really love you? Uh, today, you're going to find out just truly how loved and how valued you are by God. And this is so important. I run into a lot of people a lot of times that just sometimes feel like, I just don't know. I don't know that I know that I know that God really does love me. And so uh, I'm praying today that you would take to heart the things that we're going to talk about. Last week, just real quick, we said this is so important that you need to understand who you are. Because we said this, listen, if you don't know who you are then you won't know how to live, right? If you don't know who you are, you won't know how to live. You'll try to do life in ways that will be unfulfilling and you weren't meant to do, things that you weren't meant to experience. You'll take paths that you weren't meant to go down if you don't know who you are, who your identity is in God because who he is and what he's done. And we said the Apostle Paul who wrote Ephesians This is such an important part that he spent the first three of six chapters in Ephesians. The first half of the book is all about, here's who you are. Here's your identity. Here's what it means to truly be part of the family of God. Here's what it means to have God as your father. Here's what it means to be a son or a daughter of the king who owns everything. Here's what it means. And when you know that, listen to me, church, when you know that, you believe that, It changes the way you live. It changes the way you live. And so too many times Christians think that Christianity is just trying to not do bad things. I I believe certain doctrines and creeds, and I try to be a good person. I try to be nice. And and, and that's part of of what it means to, to be a Christian, but there's so much more than that. It's not about being a nice person. It's about being a new person. It's about being a new person in Christ and having literally Jesus in you and living through you. And it changes everything. And this is what the Apostle Paul is going to tell us today in part two of our Ephesians study. Paul's going to talk about what it means to be in Christ, have Christ in you. He says, in Christ, in him, through him. He says it 11 times in 12 verses. We're going to look at verses 3 through 14. And this whole passage is one giant, long, run-on sentence, right? In the original Greek, it literally has no punctuation. It's one long sentence, 202 Greek words in a row. Of, Paul just got excited talking about our identity, and he's going to talk about nine different ways that God has blessed us. And here's what I want you to do. I really want you to soak in these nine things that are yours that make you part of the family of God and help define your identity today, okay? And and so it's a really special um, passage of Scripture. And uh, I'm going to read the whole thing now. We'll read it. I'll try not to make comments. We'll read it. We'll come back to it. And then we'll pull it apart. And that's when I'll make the comments, all right? So let me just read the whole thing. Just soak it in. Don't wander. It's going to take about four minutes to read it. Don't wander. Soak all this in. And then we'll go back and we'll analyze it, all right? Ephesians 1, verse 3. Here's what he says. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, right? He starts up, all right, let me just make one comment real quick, one comment. (laughs) He just can't not say something, right? He starts off with this blessing. Like, he's going to list nine things, but he starts off saying, I got to bless God. I got to bless the Father. Why? Because look at all that he's blessed us with, right? That's the flow. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here it comes. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavens, in the heavens, in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us 
to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan, good plan, good plan, as a plan. Do you love that new song? It's so rich. It's so good, Psalm 23. As a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan, good plans of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will, so that we, who had already put our hope in Christ, might bring praise to his glory. In him, you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. Whew, do you see just how much God loves you? Did you hear it in here? All that you have and all that you have been blessed with. This is such a rich passage. So here's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to read uh, and pull it apart, and we're going to see nine different blessings that God has given to us. And here's my challenge. Each one of these blessings, each one of the nine, could be a sermon in and of itself. The, the, it, there's so much richness underneath each one of these categories. But we're not, we're not going to do that. We're not going to be able to do that. So you can do some math. We've got about a half hour left here divided by nine. I've got about three and a half minutes per thing that we're going to get through. And one of them is a simple doctrine to explain the doctrine of predestination. And so... <laughs> so... Here's what I'm praying. Listen and say, God, speak to my heart. Let me believe this. Some of you, you need to just believe these nine things is who you are because it will change everything about you. Some of you, you're searching for life in areas that are not part of the good plans of God. You think they're going to bring you life, but they're not bringing you life. They're going to end up bringing you trouble because you're not living according to your identity. Listen to these things. This is who you are. Let's start verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with some of the spiritual blessings in the heavens in Christ. Did I read that wrong? Yeah. With what? Every. Watch this, church. Every single possible spiritual blessing that is available, you have. God has given to you every possible single blessing in Christ. In other words, listen to me. The firstborn son, Christ, every blessing that the father is giving to him, he is also giving to the rest of the kids. Every spiritual blessing that is in Christ, he has given to us as well. This is unbelievable, every single one. Now listen, I, I know some of you are saying, you're, you're sitting there and you're thinking in your head, I don't feel very blessed. Like, I, I just, I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure I'm buying this. I don't feel very blessed, right? And you start going through the list in your head of the things that, you know, you don't have, that you want as blessings, right? I don't, well, I don't, I don't, I don't have a spouse and I, I don't have a home and I, I don't have a nice car and I, and I don't have a dog and your life sounds like a country music song, right? It's just like, I don't have all these things. And you're like, I'm not so sure that I'm blessed. And I want you to make sure that you, you, you don't miss this key part, right? Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens. Thank you. In the heavens. Listen to me. No doubt, no doubt 
there is blessings that come from following Jesus and knowing him and walking in his good plans now. A lot of these nine things that we're going to, they have impact now. They matter now. But no doubt about it, there is also this future blessing that comes when we get off of this temporary place that we're at and we go to our permanent home. They are permanent future blessings that we have in Christ that a lot of them trickle over into the here and the now. You're, you're, you'll see them as we go, okay? And, and here's, when it comes to blessing, here's, here's what I think is true, and here's what I've found. You will see what you look for. You'll see what you look for, right? This is true. Last month, last month Dana and I celebrated 28 years of marriage, and um, I am by far a blessed man. I, I'm blessed. I am blessed with her as a wife. My life is blessed because of her. But there are days where I don't see that. Because you will see what you look for. And how many of you know that it's very easy to look for the non-blessing part? You will see what you look for. The same thing is true in our relationship with God. How many times are you missing the good plans and what God has done and who you are because you're not looking for the right things? Because you've been distracted in life over here with other things and you're missing the things that God has for you. Right? So what are these things? Paul's going to list nine of them. Here we go. I'm going, to, I'm going to put at the top, because God greatly loves me, he blessed me by, and we're going to build our list. There's going to be nine of them here. Um, I'm going to suggest to you, if you want to write them down, that's great. Or at the end, take out your phones. I want you to and take a picture of them. Listen, because you're, you're going to need to be reminded of the truth. You're going to have a bad day. The enemy's going to come. He's going to whisper in your ear, God doesn't love you. You're not a good Christian. You don't deserve this. This isn't true. You need to be reminded of what the Bible says is true, not be led by your feelings, but be led by God's truth. So at the end, I want you to take a picture because every single one of these things is going to be lifted out from God's word, okay? Here's the first one. God loves me and he blessed me by, number one, choosing me. God chose you. This is, this is incredible that the God of the universe picked you. This is what it says, verse 4, Ephesians 1, verse 4. says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. This was an act of love. This whole passage is rooted in the main character trait of God being love. And so in love, he chose you. God picked you. You ever been not picked? Can I take some of you back to the fifth grade playground? <laughs> right? I got so and so, I got so and so, I got, and you're standing the whole time, like, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. And it gets down to the end, right? And it's like, all right, fine. I'll take Dunner, right? It's like, all right, all right. <laughs> right? It's not really being picked, it's just kind of being taken, right? You ever, ever had that experience? Right? It doesn't feel good, does it? God didn't do that. Captain God walked up, saw you, and said, I pick you. I pick him. I pick her. He chose you. Listen, don't make the mistake of thinking, well, God, who was all-knowing, looked down the corridor of time and knew that you were going to be such a religious, spiritual, good person that you were going to choose to say yes to God. And so he chose you because he knew you were going to say yes to him. That is not how this works, right? That would make God's decisions contingent on how we be or how we act or how we behave. And, and it's completely upside down the way it is. God is completely sovereign, completely in control. And in love, God is the one who chose us. He looked at a room full, a world full of sinners and said, I want that one. Why? Grace, love, goodness, kindness, not because of anything you have or anything you do. He doesn't need you. It's because he simply is good and chose you. Starting to feel loved, I hope, a little bit right now. I mean, just ponder this. Ponder this. 
For as long as God has been in existence, which is forever, he chose you, he knew you, he loved you. Truth number two, not only that, but God has blessed me by predestining me. All right, we'll take a minute and try to unpack this one. Let me read you the verse first, and then we'll talk about it. Verse five, it says, he predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself according to the good pleasure of his will, right? God is the one who not only chose you, but predestined or predetermined ahead of time that he was going to save you. And so scholars and theologians and skeptics push back on this doctrine and try and make sense of it. And when you wrestle it through, there really is no humanly satisfactory answer because it makes our heads hurt. And the tension that exists is this. If God is completely sovereign and God is the one who's doing the picking and the choosing and the predestining and the saving, then what part does mankind play? Do, we're not, we don't really have free will. Our free will is kind of all an illusion. We're not really free to make our own choices. God is like the giant puppet master and we're down here on strings and God is maneuvering us in such a way. And so we have this tension that exists that how can God be completely sovereign and in control and doing the picking and the choosing and man have free will? And here's the answer. The Bible teaches that both are true. You're like, well, how can both be true? Philosophers have come up with a word that the word is antinomy. Antinomy is when two truthful ideas compete with one another and seem to be incompatible, but yet they're both true at the same time. And we have a hard time figuring it out. Our finite human brains simply can't comprehend God and the ways of God, and how can God be completely sovereign and man have freedom? And all I can tell you is the Bible teaches both. I can't explain how does it work out. I can just tell you that both things are true. So let me share with kind of share with you. Let me share with you two verses that teach this doctrine um, that will help. You, I hope. I pray it will help you wrestle with this and just believe that God is completely sovereign and I'm free. I have a free will right now. You had a choice whether to get up and come here today or not. That was that was that was that was a choice that you were able to make. And so here's here's the here's the passage. It's in Matthew chapter eleven. In Matthew chapter 11, is Jesus speaking. I'm going to read the verse, and you tell me which camp um, it is, God's sovereignty or man's free will, okay? Verse 27 says this. This is Jesus speaking. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Okay, which one of these two camps does this passage line up with? God's sovereignty, right? Nobody knows the Father except the Son, and no one's going to know except the ones that the Son chooses to reveal. God's in control. God's doing the choosing. God's doing the revealing. This is what Jesus says, right? What verse is this? What's the verse, church? What verse? Come on, stay with me. What verse? 27. What's the next verse? Next sentence. The very next sentence, Jesus says, so come to me. Who? All. All who labor. All who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Open invitation to all. Anyone who wants to say yes to Jesus, open him with the, you, you come. Here in the same passage, you have God's sovereignty and man's freedom being taught by Jesus. Let me give you one more, quick. If you turn over to Joel, the book of Joel, the Old Testament book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, same thing. I'll read the beginning part. You tell me which camp this is in, okay? It, 
it, it shall come to pass, verse 32, Joel 2, 32, it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Which camp is that? Well, that's a free will camp. Yeah, we have free will. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The verse goes on, same verse. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape. This is talking about the future judgment. As the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Wait, which is it? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord or the ones that the Lord calls? Which is it? Yes. Both. You're like, how can that be both? I don't know. Aren't you a little bit glad that God is bigger than our brains? You should be. I mean, if you and I can understand every aspect of, then it's like our God's pretty small, right? Theologians, we've, we've made names to label these two camps. This is called the Calvinist camp. Right, you have different levels of Calvinists. They came up with five different points to, to organize their doctrine. It's called the tulip. Uh, I don't have time to go into that rabbit trail, but you have two-point Calvinists, three-point Calvinists, five-point Calvinists that all get stronger in the sovereignty and control of God. And then over here you have Arminian, Arminian theology, Arminians it's all freedom. It's man's free will, right? And, and, and God is kind of watching and seeing how man responds. And Arminian theology teaches we can actually lose our salvation, right? We, we, we kind of can got to stay in the graces of God. And so we've made labels and camps and we've, it's going to be, listen, it's been going on for hundreds of years. We're not going to solve it in three and a half minutes, all right? Let me give you, let me close with one illustration that maybe, maybe, maybe will help you. In, in trying to wrestle through this, okay? And the illustration is this. You're driving your car, and you're driving your car, let's just picture you're driving your car down the highway of life, and, and you're in control of your car, and you're changing lanes, and you're deciding your speed, and you're determining where you're going, and as you're driving down the highway of life, up on the right, you see a green exit sign, and the exit sign says, Jesus Christ, eternal life, Exit now. And you're like, yes, that's exactly what I want. I want Jesus Christ. Eternal. And so you choose to turn the wheel and you exit off for eternal life through Jesus Christ this way. And as you drive off the exit ramp that you chose, you look in the rearview mirror and in the back of the sign of the exit sign, it says, Joe Snyder, I chose you before the beginning of the world. Did I choose? Or did God choose? The Bible teaches both. And we can't wrap our heads around. And so we don't, we don't be fatalists and be like, well, God's going to do whatever God wants to do. I just, I'm just going to, right? No, no. You do then what the scripture tells us to do. You love him. You follow him. You let your light shine. Because the scriptures say, how can they believe if no one preaches? And how can they hear if, if there's no one talking to them? And so we've got to let our light shine. We've got to tell the word, word of Jesus. And so we let God do his part, and we be faithful to do our part. And we trust him for what we don't understand. Here all I know is in the scripture, it says God predestines. And I'm glad God's in control. I'm glad we follow a God who's in control. Number three, we've got to move on. All right? Everyone clear? If you have more questions about that, you can talk to Ryan Rouse. He'll explain it. He'll explain, he'll explain more, all right? Next one. Because God greatly loves me, he, he blessed me by adopting me. This is such a, such a beautiful picture of, of what God has done for us. Some of you, you know it very personally because you've either done it or you've been adopted. This is such a, a beautiful biblical concept. Listen to what it says, verse 5. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself. Why? It was his good pleasure of his will. Right? Adoption is the legal declaration that we are brought into the family of God. That God is our father. He has signed the papers. And now we are legally children of God that are receiving all of the rights and benefits 
and duties of what it means to be in God's family. This is what adoption is. God one day in eternity past walked into the orphanage of all these little sinner babies laid out in all their bassinets and said, I picked this one and picked you. In his love, in his goodness, he chose you and picked you and rescued you to be brought into his forever family, to now receive all of the rights and the benefits and the privileges of being part of the family of God. It truly is unbelievable. (laughs) You're brought into a family who has a dad who is the owner of everything. Do you think that changes your life? Why do so many of us still live like spiritual orphans then? It's one of the great plagues of the church today is that we have Christians that have been adopted into the family of the king. Scripture calls us royalty. We are princes and princesses of the most high God. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And yet many live like spiritual orphans. You know what a spiritual orphan, we we teach this in our freedom ministry. A spiritual orphan lives as if their life depends upon themselves because they don't have a good father who's going to provide for them, who's going to protect them, who's going to guide them, who's going to nurture them and cherish them and love them. And so they have to do that themselves. And you live with an orphan spirit. And you think you, you, you actually live like a functional deist. Deists believe in God. They believe God made the earth, spun it into existence, and God walked away from it. And there's so many Christians that live that way, that believe in God and believe they're going to heaven and live their life as if it depends on them without God being a part of it every day. It's called an orphan spirit, a spiritual orphan. And many Christians live this way. Ephesians 1 tells us that we've been adopted. Why? God loves you and he chose you. And he rescued you. Not only that, because God loves me, he blessed me by lavishing grace on me. I love the language of the Bible. Look at verse 6. To the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. Lavished. Like slathered it on. Heaped it on. Gooped it on. You're covered in grace. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he, what? Richly poured out on us. Grace. Grace is, we, we don't live in a world of grace, so it's hard to, it's hard to understand grace fully. It's such a foreign, con- we live in such a transactional world right? You work, you get a paycheck. You scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You know, we, this is the world that we live in. Grace is just undeserved, unmerited favor lavished on. I remember when our kids were little, we were trying to teach them about grace. This concept, how do you, because it's such a key aspect of, of who God is and amazing grace and like understanding grace. And so I remember we were, we were mini golfing and um, I thought this is a good time to teach them about, about grace right? Because I would dominate them. And it felt good to me, but they didn't feel good for them. So it's like, ah, right, here's, here's a lesson for grace. And so, um, and so Cole would get up, and this is when they were little, right? And he'd whack the ball hard because he's all boy, and, and it would go off the hole, over the boundary, down the sidewalk, into over the bush, right? And everything like that. And, and so I thought as a father that at the time was an appropriate time to teach them the concept of penalty strokes, right? <laughs> And so I'd put the ball back down and be like, all right, you're hitting three. Hitting three? Why am I hitting three? Well, you, you hit one out of bounds, penalty stroke two, you're laying three. You got to hit three, right? And, and I only hit it once. No, no, you're... And so, hmm, let's talk about grace. Here's grace. Let's pretend like that first one didn't happen and you have a complete do-over, fresh start. You're hitting one again. You get to do it again. Again, for free. What's that? That's grace. That's what God does for us. Every day, all day, lavishes it on you. Grace 
constant do-overs. So we give grace and grace. How many graces do I get? You get three, all right? God gives unlimited, but dad gives three. You get three in mini golf. Unlimited grace. You can't out God's grace. You can't outrun God's grace. He lavishes it on you. Some of you are so good at believing the lies of the enemy who want to heap guilt and shame and condemnation, and I'm no good, and I'm a failure, and I'm bad, and I'm not a good Christian, and the enemy whispers this stuff in his ear, and God's over here telling you, no, no, grace, grace, I'm giving you grace. Understand grace, receive my grace, believe my grace, live in my grace. There's more grace coming in Ephesians, so I'll stop there. Grace, he's given it to us. He's lavished it on us. Next one, God loves me because he's blessed me by redeeming me. What does redeeming me mean? Well, let's just look at the verse. Verse 7 says this. In him, we have redemption through his blood. Redemption. The word redeem means to buy back. To buy back. It was used actually in the slave market when an owner would come in and would redeem a slave out of bondage and would purchase, literally purchase freedom, right? This was a common thing in the first century world. You're like, how does this apply to us spiritually? Well, here's what what happened. In the beginning, back in the garden, God made us and God made us to perfectly enjoy him, to be with him and to live life with him like this. But then the enemy came along and told us there was a better way to live life. You live life with you doing what you want. You be your own God. And you get to do whatever you want, how you want. And the enemy lured us away from God. And tempted us with this thing called sin. Lured us over into sin's playground, let's call it. And that's what it is. Listen, if sin wasn't fun, we wouldn't do it. If it didn't feel good, we wouldn't be tempted by it. But it does. And it is. And so the enemy lures us around and we believe that life is found by playing in Satan's playground. And so the father comes along and says, my, my prodigals, I love you. You've sinned against me. I want you back. And he purchases us, brings us back, redeems us back into fellowship. Not that he had to make a payment to Satan, but see, it was his, it was his own holiness that has been sinned against, his own character. The kids turned their back on dad. And so things had to be made right. And so he turned to his oldest son, his first son, his only son, and he said, son, you got to pay the price for what they did. You're going to buy them back, and you're going to pay for it. What's it cost? Through his blood. It's free for you and I. Redemption cost us nothing. It cost Jesus everything. Redemption is such a beautiful doctrine to understand that God loved us so much that he bought us. He bought our freedom. He bought us out of bondage. He bought us out of slavery. And so now we're no longer slaves. Here's the challenge again, my Christian friends, is some of us still love living life in Satan's playground. We've been bought. We've been redeemed. We've been paid for. But this is what sin does. It puts you in bondage. It shackles you. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about because you can't shake it. You can't stop. And you have, it has control over you. You're addicted. You're controlled by it. Sin is powerful. But it's not more powerful than God's redeeming power. You have to simply turn your back to the, to the temptations of the enemy and believe that you're redeemed. That's what God has done. He's paid for your redemption. Not only that, how did he do that? He did that by forgiving you. Look what the next verse says. Verse 7 says this. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Forgiven. The reason that you're redeemed is because God forgave you. Every single one of your trespasses. What does trespass mean? What is trespass? Trespass is sin, right? What does it mean, though, literally, like, in the world? What does trespassing mean? Okay, going where you don't belong, right? So if uh, it's Friday night and you're 
being stupid in Walmart and they say, hey, we want you out of Walmart and they call the cops on you and the cops show up and the manager says, listen, we want them out. It's private property, they can kick you out. And the cop will write you a trespass ticket and tell you that if you come back onto the property where you're not allowed, you will be arrested for trespassing. Some version of that. Trespassing is where you go where you're not supposed to go. And that's what sin is. Sin is a trespass where the enemy lures us onto his playground and has us think this is life. But it's really trespassing. It's really God saying, no, no, you're not supposed to go there. And then he forgives you for going there. How often does he forgive me? Every single time. Every single time. It's unbelievable. Why? He loves you. His grace has covered you. There's not something you can do that God will not forgive. What's, what's next? He's blessed me by making his will known to me. Making his will known. We talked about this last week. Paul says it again here in verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ. Right? Four times in the opening 11 verses of Ephesians, Paul talks about the will of God. Andrew mentioned it again in the beginning of service. There is no better place than to be in the center of God's will. More, there's more in Ephesians chapter 2. It talks more about being in the center of God's will, living according to God's will. God wants you to know his will. He's revealed to you his will. Some of you are like, I don't get it. It is a bit of a mystery. He says it. He's made known to us the mystery of his will. It's not an unknowable mystery, though. How do you, know, how do you figure out the mystery? Here's how. You hang out with the one who has the will. It's God. He has good plans. He has good plans. This is what he does. How do I know God's good plans? You hang out with him. It no longer is a mystery. This is what it says. He made known to us the mystery. You can know the mystery of God's will by hanging out with God. Some of us like to do this with God. You ever had this conversation with God? God, if you could kind of let me know what the next year looks like, I would love to know that. Actually, while you're at it, how about the next five years? If you could give me the five-year plan, that would be great. And God goes, how about I tell you today? And you're like, no, 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 I, I got today. Um, I'm just looking for a longer-range forecast, if you could provide that. And here's what God knows, that if he is going to give you the five-year plan, one, you'd either be overwhelmed, or two, you'd say thanks, and you'd go, and you'd run, and you'd leave. Behind. And he's like this, how about you walk with me today, and I'll show you today. God, what about tomorrow? I'm glad you asked. Walk with me tomorrow, and I'll show you tomorrow. God, you want me to just like to walk with you every day? Exactly. Exactly. That's the Christian life. Walking with God every day because he's got good plans and he wants you to know his will. Not only that, look at this one. Next to last one, he's blessed you because he's given you an inheritance. He's given you an inheritance. The God who owns everything and has adopted you into his family goes, wait till you see what I got for you. Wait till you see what's yours. Look at verse 11. In him, we've also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. Listen, by the way, side note, whole point of your life, bring praise to his glory. Bring praise to his glory. That's the whole goal of the Christian life is to shine a spotlight on our Father. You have an inheritance that awaits you, provided for by the Father. <laughs> Can you go, go back for me one slide, verse 11? Notice this. In him, we have also received an inheritance. What, what tense is that? It's past tense. Wait, I've already got my inheritance? Yep. Already, past tense, it's already done. It's already a sure thing. It's a sure bet. Why? God's already adopted you. He's already signed the adoption papers. You're already in the family. It's a guarantee of what is to come. And you're like, well, how do I know 
It's a guarantee. Paul goes, let me answer that in the next verse. Verse 13. Verse 13 says, in him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation when you believed. God's like, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit when you said yes to me. Verse 14. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. He is the guarantee when, until the redemption of the possession, like until you're home, God's like, I'll just give you the Holy Spirit. He's the down payment. He's the guarantee. He's the seal. If you're a a single guy in here and your desire is to be married, and you're like, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to... um, I'm going to go over to Greece and find me a beautiful Greek woman, and that's who I'm, I'm going to marry. And so you travel over to Greece, and you spend some time there, and you find yourself a beautiful Greek woman who loves Jesus, who loves Jesus. And, and, and uh, you decide that you're going to give her a ring. In Greece, you don't give an engagement ring. You give what's called an arabon. Arabon is the Greek word for engagement ring. If you can go, um, oh no, right there. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. The word down payment is the Greek word arabon, engagement ring. It's a pledge. It's a commitment. It is a, other translations, right? If you, if you go to other translations, um, they, they translate it as a guarantee, a deposit, a pledge of what is to come. The Holy Spirit is the arabon of what is to come, the pledge of a future wedding, of a a future reunion that's to take place, where you will receive your inheritance, where you will experience the wedding of the Lamb, where the bride of Christ, which is what the church is called, the bride, will be reunited with the groom. And he's given us an arabon. The groom has given us a ring. And it's the Holy Spirit, it's God himself who lives within you to show you what kind of heaven on earth can kind of be like. This is what it's supposed to be, with God in you, living through you. Can you go back to verse 13? He actually uses the word and says, this is the seal. In him you were sealed. The seal is, a, it, it, it means it's real, it's authentic, it's, it's done, it's a guarantee. The seal. You ever hear the expression, signed, sealed, and delivered? That's signed, sealed, and delivered. Where does that come from? That comes from the early 1900s. Signed, sealed, and delivered. It was used of property deeds. And if, if I owned property and I had the deed, and you were a buyer and I was a seller, both of us would go to the bank. And they'd make a copy of the deed. And I would sign it as the buyer, and you would sign it as the seller. Or vice versa, whoever's doing what. We both would sign it. And then the bank would seal it with wax, making it authentic, real, guaranteed. And then they'd send both the buyer and the seller home with a deed that has been signed, sealed, and delivered. That's what the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is that seal, that signed, sealed, and delivered, that you are part of the family of God. Your inheritance is guaranteed. This is your future. This is who you are. Live this way now. Live this way. All of these things, I, I've gone so fast through this list, I feel like I'm missing so much. The, can you go to the last slide and just put up the list? Take your phones out, take a picture of this. I want you to see everything that you have and everything that you are. This is who you are. If you don't know who you are, you won't know how to live. This is who you are. This is who you are. You're chosen. You're predestined, you're adopted, you're lavished with grace, you're redeemed, you're forgiven. You've got a will that God is making known to you. He's got an inheritance for you and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna ask the worship team to come. You have to believe this, church. You have to believe this is who you are. Do you feel loved now? When you stop and you think about what God has done for you, this is who you are. 
So the next time the devil comes and wants to whisper in your ear, pull out this list, look at him and say, shut up. Just shut up. Look at what my father has done. Look at who I am. Look at what I have because of who he is. He's such a good father. Why would he do all this? Because he greatly loves you. He greatly loves you. And so, church, I pray that you would believe this. I pray that you would believe it and that you would believe it so much it affects the way you live.